Hey guys, welcome back to our series on the Book of Enoch. Now, if you're new to the series, please start at the beginning. This is our 10th video in the series, and we've been covering this book already now, talking about how it's backed up by the New Testament, uh, it's endorsed by the New Testament, Jude quoted it, and not only did he quote it, but he called it prophecy. Jesus referenced it, and not only did he reference it, he called it scripture. And we've been going through video after video showing how the New Testament quotes this book repeatedly over and over and over again. They taught from this book. The apostles and Jesus considered this book to be an authority. They considered this book to be scripture. And we should as well. And we've been covering all that through this series. So you can go to our channel. You can go to our website to find this series. Please start at the beginning. Work your way through it so you understand where I'm coming from and why I'm stressing the importance of this book. Now, in the last video, we looked at other cultures around the world in ancient times, and we showed how they were all telling the same story that's told in the Book of Enoch. All of these ancient cultures were saying, yeah, these events happened. They were all telling the same story from their own perspectives. And this is really important because when you read the story that is told in the Book of Enoch, it's really easy for us today to read that story and say, this is obviously fiction. It's really easy for us to read the story today and say, well, this obviously didn't happen because it's so weird to us. It's so different than everything we've been taught our entire lives. But as we saw in the last video, all the cultures of the ancient world were all telling the same story. Cultures that were spread out, spread across oceans, okay? People in North America were telling the same story that was being told in Mesopotamia, the same story that was told in the Book of Enoch. This story that we read in the book of Enoch to us is weird and fanciful and seems like total fiction. And yet the ancient world all over the world were all saying, yes, this happened. And they lived so much closer to the time. So we shouldn't just dismiss it as fiction because it's weird. It's weird to us because it goes against the history that we have been taught. And so in this video, we're going to look at the archaeological evidence for this story, okay? When you read the story, there are certain elements of it that you would expect to find in the archaeological record. Not every element, but there are definitely some elements that we should expect to find. For example, you might not expect to find archaeological evidence of actual watchers, fallen angels walking around on Earth. You know, maybe there's not going to be evidence of those exact individuals, but the story says that they had children and these children were giants. We should expect to find archaeological evidence of giants. Furthermore, the story says that the Watchers taught mankind technology and knowledge and advancement. And we should expect to find archaeological evidence that there was some kind of technology or advancement. In addition to all of that, we should expect to see evidence of some sort of ancient cataclysmic war because the Book of Enoch tells us that these giants, the children of the Watchers, fought against each other and wiped each other out. And that they were on the earth for hundreds of years, they had an advanced civilization all around the earth, and then they fought a giant war against each other and wiped each other out, which would have wreaked a ton of destruction all around the world. And we should expect to see something like that in the archaeological record. So, in this video, we're going to be looking at that archaeological record to see does it support this story? However, before we look at that, before we look at any of that evidence, we need to address a question that is going to come up, a very obvious question that always comes up whenever you think about any of these things. It was a big question for me when I first started looking into this stuff. And that question is, if there's a ton of evidence, which there is, for giants and ancient technology and an ancient worldwide civilization and an ancient cataclysmic war that destroyed 
tons of things all over the world. If there is a ton of evidence for this stuff, why is no one talking about it? Why is this something that's not taught in schools? I mean, we've all grown up, we've gone to school, we've learned history, and we are taught the same history. We are taught that more or less linearly, we have progressed as mankind from cavemen until where we're at today. More or less. That in the ancient past, we were primitive cavemen, and now we have progressed to our technological age today. And so if there's evidence, if there's an abundance of evidence that exists that shows that this is not true, then why is this the history we're being taught? Why are we not being told about the evidence that indicates all of the things told in the book of Enoch? And that's what I want to start off with in this video is I want to address this question. Why is this not being taught? Why have we not heard of this? In order to address this question, I want to point us to the book of 2 Peter in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter said, It is most important for you to understand what will happen in the last days. People will ridicule you. They willfully forget what happened long ago. By the word of God, heaven was made and the earth was made from water and with water. Then the world was flooded and destroyed with water. In this passage, Peter is saying it is most important for you to understand what is going to happen in the last days. Now, I should pause there real quick and just clarify that throughout the New Testament, the apostles referred to the entire age since Jesus, all the way till today and beyond, they referred to this entire age as the last days, okay? So they're not talking about the end times like we typically think of it today in Christianity. They're talking about this entire age. And he's saying, it's important for you to understand what will happen in the last days. We live in the last days. It's important that we understand what will happen. And he says what will happen. People will ridicule you. And he says they willfully forget what happened long ago. This is not an ignorant forgetfulness. This is a willful forgetfulness. They are choosing to forget and ignore what happened long ago. And then he specifically says what it is they're forgetting. He says they're forgetting creation by the word of God. Heaven was made and the earth was made. And they're forgetting the flood. The world was flooded and destroyed with water. These are the two things that people will willfully forget in the last days. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? The reason I'm bringing this up is because this is precisely what we see today. We see people willfully forgetting creation and the flood, and by extension, they're forgetting everything that happened in between creation and the flood, which includes the entire story of the Book of Enoch. And this is exactly what we're dealing with, and this is exactly why you don't see the evidence that supports the Book of Enoch presented anywhere in mainstream science. Even though that evidence is all over the world and very abundant, you don't see it taught. Why? Because by extension of deleting creation and the flood from our history, they're forced to also delete all of those events that Enoch describes, including giants and an ancient civilization that spanned the world and technology and advancement and an ancient war that wiped them all out. By extension, they have to delete all of that from our history as well. And that's why we're not taught about all of the evidence that points to these things. Modern science has moved away from the actual scientific method and has moved to what is called scientism, which is when they're teaching their worldview and they're putting their worldview forward as if it is proven fact, but it's not fact. They see the evidence for something like a worldwide flood and they do not want to acknowledge that flood, so they create a theory to cover it up. But when that theory then gets holes in it, they create a new theory to prop up that theory. And when the new theory has holes in it, they create a new theory to prop up that theory. And they end up building this house of cards that can't possibly stand, but as long as they are all teaching it, it will continue to stand. And this is what's going on in modern science. And I wanna show you this. So to start off, we're gonna look at a documentary put together by Ben Stein. This documentary is called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. And we're gonna look at a very small clip from it, but. The whole documentary is a really good documentary. I highly recommend it. You can find it online for free to watch. In this documentary, 
Ben Stein is specifically looking at creation. Okay, so Peter said creation and the flood. These are the two things they're going to willfully ignore. And then what I'm saying is by extension, they have to then forget everything that happened in between, including the book of Enoch. So we're going to start off by looking at creation. And this is what Ben Stein is looking at. They are willfully forgetting that God created the world. And Ben Stein is able to show that this is something that many scientists are recognizing that the evidence points to intelligent design. But when scientists begin to acknowledge that, they are shut down, they're ostracized, they lose their tenure, the scientific establishment comes after them and destroys their lives. And he goes through case after case after case where he documents how this is exactly what is happening. Scientists are not being allowed to follow the evidence because that evidence contradicts the story that they are trying to teach, the worldview they are trying to teach. So let's look at that real quick. We are losing our freedom in one of the most important sectors of society, science. I have always assumed that scientists were free to ask any question, to pursue any line of inquiry without fear of reprisal. But recently, I've been alarmed to discover that this is not the case. It all began when I met evolutionary biologist Richard Sternberg in Washington, DC. His life was nearly ruined when he strayed from the party line while serving as editor of a scientific journal affiliated with the prestigious Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Your office was over there? That's correct. This here is the West Wing. Directly ahead of us is the West Wing of the Natural History Museum. So now you're not there anymore because you're a bad boy. No, I'm not. No, I was, I was exiled. You're, you're a bad boy. You question the powers that be. What was Dr. Sternberg's crime? He dared to publish an article by Dr. Stephen Meyer one of the leading lights of the intelligent design movement. The paper ignited a firestorm of controversy merely because it suggested intelligent design might be able to explain how life began. As a result, Dr. Sternberg lost his office, his political and religious beliefs were investigated, and he was pressured to resign. The questioning of Darwinism was, was a, a bridge too far for many. The, mentioning of intelligent design that occurs at the end of the paper was was over the top and i think the intelligent design proponents have raised a number of very important questions and you wanted to get those questions brought up and discussed placed on, placed on the table placed on the table people were so upset about it they were so upset that you could see their they had a physical emotional reaction wow they were saying that Stephen C. Meyer is a well-known Christian, that Stephen C. Meyer is an intelligent design proponent, that Stephen C. Meyer is a Republican. It was all couched in terms of religion, politics, and sociology. The way the chair of the department um, uh, put it is that I was viewed as an intellectual terrorist. Terrorist. Because of giving the topic of intelligent design some modicum of credibility. What happened to Dr. Sternberg was terrible, but surely it was just an isolated case. I was still pretty skeptical, so naturally I checked in with the head of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer. So I can't prove there is no God or Yahweh in your case, any more than I can prove there is no Isis, Zeus, Apollo, Brahma, Ganesha, Mithras, Allah, or for that matter, the flying spaghetti monster. You roll up your sleeves, you get to work, you do the research, you get your grants, you get you get your data, you publish, and you work your butt off, and that's how you get your theories taught. Well, but wait a minute, what if you try and try and roll up your sleeves and go to work and work your butt off, and they say, well, we're gonna fire you if you even mention the word intelligent design. Mm, I don't think that's happening. Where is that happening? After Dr. Caroline Crocker simply mentioned intelligent design in her cell biology class at George Mason University, her promising academic career came to an abrupt end. My supervisor invited me into his office. He said, I'm going to have to discipline you for teaching creationism. And I said, I mentioned intelligent design on a couple of slides, but I did not teach creationism. He said, nonetheless, you have to be disciplined. At the end of the semester, I lost my job. 
Not only did this well-loved professor lose her job at George Mason, she suddenly found herself blacklisted, unable to find a job anywhere. So whenever I interviewed for a job, I would be offered it usually on the spot. Since this has happened, and since people can Google my name, I'm finding that when I send my credentials, I do get interviews, I get many interviews, but I never get offered a job. I don't tell them about my, about my uh, science sin. I was only trying to teach what the university stands for, which is academic freedom. There's nothing to be learned in neurosurgery by assuming a, a, an accidental origin for the, the parts of the brain that we work on. It wasn't just biologists who were feeling the Darwinist wrath. When neurosurgeon Michael Egnor wrote an essay to high school students saying doctors didn't need to study evolution in order to practice medicine, the Darwinists were quick to try and exterminate this new threat. A lot of people on a lot of blogs called me um, unprintable names that were printed. <laughs> there are a lot of very, very nasty comments. Um, <clears throat> other people suggested that people call the university I work at and uh, suggested perhaps it's time for me to retire. I realized when I kind of went public with, with my doubts about the adequacy of Darwin's theory uh, that, uh, you know, that I would encounter criticism. Uh, what has uh, amazed me is the um, uh, viciousness and the, the sort of uh, baseness of it. I'm an old guy, I have uh, tenure, I'm academically safe, but the young people and what, what is happening to them in America right now because of this scientism gulag is, uh, is really terrible. Apparently, Professor Marx was not as safe as he thought. A few months after this interview, Baylor University shut down his research website and forced him to return grant money once they discovered a link between his work and intelligent design. In order to attract grants, you have to market yourself. So you put up sites and call yourself labs and groups and things like that in order to get visibility. And in my entire experience in academia, I never went to any superior and asked them any permission to put up any of these labs. So uh, the fact that this was singled out, let alone shut down, is jaw-dropping. It's astonishing. I have never been uh, treated like this in my about 30 years in academia. Shut up, you freak! I say shut up! It's a man! If you peel back the onion, I think that there is no doubt that the center of this is my work in what would some would call intelligent design. People really get emotional about this. Uh, when you ever say intelligent design in, in a room of academics, them's fighting words. Creationists. Astronomer Guillermo Gonzalez found himself in a fierce shootout with Iowa State University following the publication of his book, arguing that the universe is intelligently designed. Despite a stellar research record that has led to the discovery of several planets, his application for tenure was denied, putting his career in jeopardy. I worried about my tenure a little bit in 2005 when the petition was being circulated because uh, I viewed that as a strategy of Hector Avalos and his associates to try to poison the atmosphere on campus against me because he knew I didn't, I wasn't tenured yet and I was very vulnerable. I have little doubt that I would have tenure now uh, if I hadn't done any professional work on intelligent design. Dr. Gonzalez had this advice for scientists who might be thinking about following his example. If they value their careers, <laughs> <laughs> they should keep quiet about their intelligent design views. We know there are times and places to be quiet, and other times and places when we can make noise if we want to. Will you show us? Of course. Boys and girls, how would you like to show some of the ways we know of being quiet? It's the kind of thing where you just learn to keep your mouth shut. In addition to those scientists who are willing to appear on camera, we encountered many more who didn't dare show their face for fear of losing their jobs. You use an intelligent design perspective to get the research done, but you're not allowed to talk about it in public. And so there is definitely incentive, if you think about it, for people to remain within the mainstream. You know, what, what's he up to? What, what is he thinking? Is he one of them? That kind of thing. If I write intelligent design, they hear creationism. They hear religious right. They hear theocracy. So it appears Mr. Shermer, 
the self-styled skeptic, was wrong on this one. Intelligent design was being suppressed in a systematic and ruthless fashion. Now, Ben Stein continues in this documentary where he shows that the scientific world is really shutting down any other narrative than what it wants, and they're not following the actual evidence. And he interviews a lot of people who are talking about intelligent design who are not even Judeo-Christian. Just They're just simply saying the, the facts, the evidence that we're finding points to some sort of intelligent design. And these people are being shut down by the scientific community. They're not allowed to follow the actual evidence. So you can go watch that documentary. It's a great documentary. Uh, lots of great things in there. Uh, but next, I want to read a, a, a passage here from the book Forbidden History. This is edited by J. Douglas Kenyon. It's actually, every chapter is a different article written by a different author. Overall, I'm not a huge fan of this book, but it does have a few very good snippets in it. And I want to read some of those here for you now. So this first passage is from chapter one called Darwin's Demise. And I want to just stress as I read this, this was not written by Christians. This is not a Christian book. These are secular authors writing this. Secular scientists. That's, I, I think that's really important to stress that it's not just Christian creationists who are, you know, fighting against Darwinism. No, even secular scientists recognize that Darwinism doesn't hold any water. Okay, what we're being taught does not hold water. The evidence doesn't back it up. And these are secular, non-religious people who are saying, okay, it's time that we address the elephant in the room. What we're teaching in schools does not hold any water. So I think that's really important for us to recognize because if you go to an atheist and you say these things from a Christian perspective, they're just going to blow you off because you're just a Christian, you're just a Bible-thumping Christian, and these people are secular scientists who are saying the same thing. And I think that will help carry some weight to these atheist people that we interact with. That No, we're not just saying, oh, the Bible says so, therefore it's true. We're saying, no, the evidence says so. And scientists are recognizing this. So anyway, let's take a look real quick at what this book says. Remembering these are secular, many times atheist scientists saying this. Chapter 1, Darwin's Demise. In an interview about his penetrating critique, Facts of Life, Shattering the Myth of Darwinism, the science journalist Richard Milton describes what made him write the book. It was the absence of transitional fossils that first made me question Darwin's idea of gradual change. I realized, too, that the procedures used to date rocks were circular. Rocks are used to date fossils. Fossils are used to date rocks. From here, I began to think the unthinkable. Could Darwinism be scientifically flawed? As a science journalist and writer with a lifelong passion for geology and paleontology and no religious beliefs to get in the way, I was in a unique position to investigate and report on the state of Darwin's theory in the 1990s. The result was unambiguous. Darwin doesn't work here anymore. According to Milton, who had been a firm Darwinist, when he began to rethink the theory, he became a regular visitor to Great Britain's prestigious Natural History Museum. He put the best examples that Darwinists had gathered over the years under intense scrutiny. One by one, they failed to pass the test. He realized that many scientists around the world had already arrived at the same conclusion. The emperor was as naked as an ape. Why had no one gone public with papers critiquing the theory? What trained, credentialed scientist earning a living through a university or government position wants to jeopardize a career and earn the disdain of colleagues in the process? Apparently none. So once again, we've got this secular atheist scientist, Richard Milton, who is coming from a Darwinist perspective, and he goes and he looks at the evidence, and he ends up coming to the conclusion, yeah, since Darwin lived back in the 1800s, we've collected a lot of evidence, and we can see very, very clearly now, Darwinism's wrong. And yet he's saying, why are all these scientists who recognize this to be true, they recognize it quietly on their own. Why are they not saying anything? Because they're going to jeopardize their careers. Their livelihood will be taken away from them. You're not allowed to speak out against the establishment. Or you get ruined. Same thing Ben Stein was seeing in his documentary. If you speak out against the establishment, they shut you down and they destroy your life. 
It's bullying tactics, but this is how science is working today. And this is why you don't hear about this evidence when you go to school. This is exactly what Peter told us about. Okay, people are willfully forgetting creation. This is not a, an ignorant forgetfulness. This is not they're uninformed and they're forgetting. No, they see the evidence. They see what is going on. They see that these things don't line up, but they are willfully forgetting. Science is choosing to teach what the evidence does not point to. And here we've looked at creation specifically, so now let's move over and start looking at the flood. And in this next quote I want to read from the same book, he's talking about the flood. In chapter 6, it's called The Case for the Flood. And again, this is secular, non-Christian, non-Judeo-Christian scientists who are saying the evidence points to a flood in the ancient world. And in this next quote, you can see how the author connects the dots where he's showing that all of the evidence for an ancient worldwide civilization, all of the things that we see in the Book of Enoch, which we're going to look at throughout the rest of this video, all of that evidence is also being thrown out because the scientists are refusing to recognize the flood. By refusing to recognize the flood, they are forced to also refuse to recognize the advanced civilization that was wiped out by that flood. Okay, the book of Enoch tells us about the watchers coming and teaching technology and the giants and how they established this mighty civilization. Then they all ended up fighting wars with each other and ultimately the flood came and wiped out everyone on earth. And the evidence all around the world points to a flood and points to a civilization that was wiped out by that flood. And yet scientists are refusing to acknowledge all of that evidence because they do not want to acknowledge the flood. They do not want to acknowledge that the Bible taught a true story. So let's look at this next quote here from Forbidden History, Chapter 6, The Case for the Flood. The scientific establishment unknowingly cast its lot against a prehistorical civilization before the evidence began showing up. It did so by enforcing the 18th century rule of reason which stipulated that God could not be used as an explanation for physical reality, thereby rejecting out of hand the possible validity of all biblical accounts and, in the case of a worldwide prehistoric society, the possibility that a flood of biblical proportions destroyed all but the megalithic evidence for that civilization. So pausing right there, he's talking not only about the flood, but he's talking about the advanced civilization that existed prior to the flood, which the evidence supports. This is the story of the book of Enoch, an advanced civilization prior to the flood. He's saying that there was a rule in place that you cannot use God to explain anything. And by doing this, they had to cast away all of the evidence for the flood, as well as all of the evidence for an ancient advanced civilization that existed prior to the flood which is exactly what we're talking about in this video. So continuing. Making the world of science safe against Bible thumpers became the overriding goal of 19th century science. Science at this time was unaware that accounts of a universal flood appear around the globe, the universal flood being a part of the myths and traditions of more than 500 separated cultures. They didn't realize they were not just throwing out the Bible, they were throwing out what all of the ancient cultures of the world said. Again, that's what we looked at in our last video. Continuing. As explorers started to bring home descriptions of the world from afar, science was horrified to see a picture emerging of a planet scarred by massive movements of water, generally from the northwest to the southeast, over its surface. The northwestern sides of whole mountains were scored as if they had been subjected to fast-moving waters containing gravel and boulders. Flood water was unmistakably the source of the scoring because science could see the same effect from fast-moving rivers. Furthermore, those same sides of the mountains were also home to massive buildups of drift material, detritus presumably left behind by receding waters. Again, this was an effect that mimicked natural actions in the real world. These drift deposits even contain the remains of animals, including the woolly mammoth. More horrifying to 19th century scientists than the evidence of water damage and silting 
where the gigantic boulders exposed to public view all over the European countryside in places where they clearly didn't belong. These oversized rocks, many weighing thousands of tons, could have been moved only by massive floodwaters carrying them along and then depositing them when the waters receded. What to do with these discoveries that constituted irrefutable evidence of a worldwide flood? If science had been true to the evidence and concluded that the evidence had in fact resulted from a worldwide flood, religious crazies would have filled the pulpits and newspapers with cries that the biblical story of the flood and thus the entire Bible had been scientifically confirmed. Not a desirable result. Science, however, is an enterprise that turns beliefs into facts. And it accomplishes this feat so well that its myths become more real than actual facts. It takes hypotheses, mere notions, and crafts a methodology designed to do the impossible, to turn those notions into facts. The task that faced science when it was confronted with the incontrovertible evidence of a worldwide flood was to create a scientific fact that would provide a substitute for the already existing evidence left behind by the actual flood. Louis Agassiz, I'm probably saying that wrong, consolidated speculations by enthroning himself as the inventor of the Ice Age. Agassiz's creation for scientific and public consumption was a distinct reversal of the scientific process. Instead of taking an idea and using unknown facts to prove it to be a scientific fact, Agassiz took disparate facts that led inexorably to an uncomfortable conclusion, a worldwide flood, and then created an idea, the Ice Age, that could be used in place of the uncomfortable flood idea. And then he exclaimed his Ice Age theory to be scientific fact. The Ice Age is no more than a proposition, a possible explanation for the reality that we see. Science saw the evidence of the Flood described in the Bible and created the Ice Age to avoid the appearance of verifying an event described in the Bible. In the meantime, subsequent discoveries continued to verify the existence of a worldwide flood and mirrored the hundreds of newly encountered myths and traditions attesting to the flood's actuality. Now, the author goes on from here talking about why the Ice Age doesn't fit the evidence, and you can go read that for yourself. But then he continues talking about the result of them building this Ice Age theory. He says, there was no room in the past for a megalithic society, a worldwide antediluvian civilization that would easily explain both the physical remains of such a civilization and the flood that brought that civilization to an end. The past was dominated by an ice age, created to explain the evidence for the flood that destroyed the worldwide civilization. Today, we're stuck with the scientific fact the myth that ice can creep down from the North Pole and cover Europe and North America. Once the scientific community has accepted a theory as fact, any evidence is acceptable so long as it is cast to support the theory, and no evidence is sufficient to disprove the theory. Without opposition, the theory becomes part of the founding principles of whole new fields of inquiry. And once again, I'll point out that was all written by non-Christians, written by secular, often atheist scientists who are saying science is no longer doing what science claims to do. They're saying the biblical story of the flood and a worldwide culture which was wiped out by that flood, that is supported by the evidence. And they're trying to cover this up. The book of Enoch tells us about this advanced civilization of giants who had technology and all sorts of knowledge given to us by the watchers and that this civilization lasted for hundreds of years and spanned across the world. And then ultimately they fought wars with each other until finally God wiped out everybody with a flood. That is what the book of Enoch says and that is what the evidence points to. But because these scientists do not want to acknowledge the flood story, they do not want to give credence to something that the Bible says, 
they've also had to ignore all of the evidence for that civilization. This is what this author is saying. By choosing to ignore the flood, they have been forced to also ignore the civilization that was wiped out by that flood. And so they continue teaching us this story that we have come from cavemen and advanced to today, and there is just, that is our history. We've slowly, linearly progressed over time. This is what they want us to believe, and they don't want us to understand that, no, there was an advanced civilization in the distant past, and that civilization was wiped out by a flood. They don't want us to understand that that's what the evidence points to, because their goal is to promote their worldview and not to promote what the actual evidence says and not to teach actual history. This is exactly what Peter told us would happen. In the last days, people will willfully ignore, they will willfully forget creation and the flood. And you can see this secular scientist here saying, by extension, they have been forced to also willfully forget the ancient civilization that was wiped out by that flood. And so again, why are we talking about all this? We're talking about all this because as we look at the evidence throughout the rest of this video, for giants and an ancient civilization and all of this stuff, all the, all the things that Enoch said, when we look at the archeological evidence that proves that the book of Enoch is a true story, we need to remember that all of this is why we are not taught these things in school. This is why, this is why you haven't heard these things before. Even though the evidence is in abundance, even though there is a huge amount of evidence for all of this, you are not taught these things because it goes against the narrative that they want you to believe. They willfully forget creation and the flood and by extension, everything that happened in between. So next I wanna look at one more clip that talks about how they are willfully forgetting creation, how they're teaching evolution and it doesn't fit the evidence. And then in this clip, he begins to transition into the first topic that we're gonna be going through, which is giants. And so in this next clip, we can start to see some of the evidence of giants that is also being covered up. So we're walking down here towards the Pluxy River here in Glen Rose, Texas. We're gonna make a hard left here and walk down to the river. These dinosaur tracks are in Cretaceous limestone, which according to the theory of evolution is dated at 110 million years old. And so you still see this dinosaur track here. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna walk down this way, but this dinosaur track is walking right through here, right along the edge of where we're standing on this platform, right down through this way. This is his stride. So this is, would be one track here. This would be the next stride right here. And then this is the next one right here. And then this one's kind of under some mud and he keeps walking this way. These tracks, the, the erosion rate should be five foot down. And we see that these tracks are still here. They're not eroded five foot down. If the erosion rates were true, uh, going back millions of years, these tracks should be disappeared millions of years ago, mm -hmm. but they're not. Mm -hmm. There should be an erosion level of five feet. It should totally obliterate the tracks, but it doesn't. Why? Because these tracks are much more recent. This is a great example of a track that's got water in it. You can really see the definition. They're theropod, meaning they're three-toed. So the left digit, the middle digit, mm -hmm. you can see kind of where the claw marking mm -hmm. is here. Mm -hmm. And then you got the right digit, the back of the heel here. Mm -hmm. And so just a little bigger than my hand, about mm -hmm. the size of your hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every year we open this up to the public for annual excavations, for families, for kids, for um, high school kids, college kids, adults. They can all come and they can participate in original excavations for dinosaur tracks. Um, this is one of the only places, one of the few places in the world that you can do this. So it's a really a unique opportunity to come excavate. Most paleontology professors have taught and the classroom has never excavated one dinosaur track. Really? My son's probably got more field experience than those guys do. But my role was really, um, if this was authentic, then original excavation should show that there's no way that this could be carved. Mm -hmm. And so 
really the only way to know is to excavate under these ledges That's right. and do the work and the labor exactly. and find you out for that. you mean, can't exactly. fake this no. i mean this is so hard this is all limestone i realize that man this is really this is yeah. this this is yeah. real on the same layer that we're standing on now is uh, the human fossil footprints have been found it's been highly controversial robbie because Dinosaurs and man are supposed to be separated by 65 million years. Is this isolated to Glenrose or is your other footprints found around the world? And it turns out uh, this is not an isolated phenomenon unique to Glenrose on a little river in Texas. This is found in a lot of other places around the world. The expert uh, said they look human, they match the human morphology, but they go, oh, we gotta, we gotta, you know, they're, they're in rock 3.6 yeah. million years old, so yeah. they can't be human. So they, they say, well, we're going to have to reclassify this. Well, it doesn't work with the evolution narrative. No. I headed to Crosbyton, Texas to meet the remarkable man behind the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. Joe Taylor is a passionate paleontologist who has spent much of his life exposing the lies of scientism. He has a strong commitment to see the true science put forward with the evidence that he has collected over the years. It was very hard to believe that the mainstream scientific community have dismissed much of what Joe Taylor's work has revealed. From looking through the fossil record, he showed me it only validates a biblical perspective and destroys the evolutionary narrative that has been broadly accepted. His clear evidence that supports a worldwide flood has been ignored. The approach of the science community is to sweep findings like Joe's under the rug. They cannot accept, they will not accept, and will do everything possible to keep truths hidden. Hello, Joe. Oh, Joe, I'm Robbie Davidson. Joe Taylor. Very nice, nice to meet you. you. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. There's a presumption that when someone says science, that, that, that when someone says they're a scientist, they immediately have credibility. And, and you don't know if they've made stupid conclusions or not. So they might look through a, a microscope, they might do a DNA test and all that. That doesn't mean they're telling you the whole story. You know, you can test, we, we had some bones tested or wood tested. One end was of, of a, a vastly different age than the other, side, the other end of the piece. Well then, what's true? We're gonna tell the kids in the late 1940s, they invented carbon dating. We're gonna explain a little bit about radiometric dating and how it's supposed to work, and then show you that it does not work, okay? It sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess everything up. If we had walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know, Mr. Holman, it's burning when I got here. Okay, well then, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure the height of the candle. Suppose the candle is seven inches tall. Who can tell me when it was lit? Okay, nobody. Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure the rate of burn. Suppose we determine it's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You're going to have a hard time telling me unless you're willing to make some assumptions. You find a fossil in the dirt. You can measure how much C14 is in it. Very accurately, by the way. And you can measure how fast it's decaying. That's just like measuring the height of your candle and how fast it's burning. Now, when did that animal die? You don't have a clue. Here's what you ought to consider about carbon dating. Samples of known age, it doesn't work. If it's a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. <laughs> Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. Living penguins, carbon dated 8,000 years old. I, I try to make three major points here. One is the, the rapid burial of most fossils, which says worldwide flood. If you know where they're buried, you know where they're buried under hundreds of feet of mud, it goes around the world, it has to be the, the flood. Giantism argues against everything starting off little bitty and getting more and more complex. So I have a lot of giant things in here to show that's just simply not true. This uh, is a, a cast of a sculpture I made. A uh, professor at a, uh, asked me to make one based on a report from uh, a road construction guy in Egypt and Holmes and Uranzora. I made myself a cast and do a, did a drawing to fit this bone just to show how tall this guy would have been. His heels go down about six more inches, but his, uh, the bottom of his rib cage is coming to 9'3". So how tall was the man? Let's say he was at least 14 feet, maybe maybe more. He's the same size as King Og in the Bible. So what's the problem? A lot of creationists get all upset. King Og, you believe in King Og, don't you? And all the other giants that said they were as tall as cedar trees? How tall is a cedar? Well, it's at least 20 feet. Well, that's 
this guy would look like a shrimp to them. But these are all over the place. <clears throat> so I wrote a book called Giants Against Evolution to show that, okay, if these things are uh, uh, in the past, why are they so huge? Why are we, the six foot guys here, at the top of creation? When you got these people out here that are a, maybe a few feet tall up to guys that are 20, 30 feet tall, that would mess up the old monkey to man lineup. That's the problem. Besides that, everybody knows the story about, well, he used to, everybody knew the story about David and Goliath. And that is in the Bible. Well, if that's true, you know, we can't be putting these giant skeletons up because they want to be talking about the Bible. That's the reason we have the museum here, the American Museum of Natural History, is to disprove the Bible. So giants, giants are a huge problem for archaeologists, the paleontologists and all that, because they shouldn't be. So this guy here, this is us today. That's probably a, uh, a Comanche Indian, and uh, it might have been, I always thought he was six feet tall, but maybe he's more. This will be your ancestor. Maybe. <laughs> But you know this whole ancestor thing? We, th we uh, have been told that people were so primitive and they finally came out of Africa and they learned to make a flint arrowhead and say, ugh. Well, it's so much different than that. The evidence is so different than that. And the further back you go, the smarter people were. This is called uh, Max Track from Glen Rose. Uh, Dr. Carl Ball and the team excavated them several years ago. This is the only one I know of that was molded. It's a little bit warped because the mother mold was probably not available when they molded it. But you know, this is no small guy here. And whether his heel ends here or there, it doesn't matter. Whether he's got five, six, or seven toes, it's a little undecided. He's a big man. People that were there said, yeah, we know those are real tracks, but they're too controversial. So what? Why not put them out there? People love, love people more than anything on earth. And giant people, little people, big people, weird people, we love people. So why not put these in the museums? because they vindicate the Bible. There's all kinds of historical documentation of finding giants in, in the Americas and all over. And then once the Smithsonian and Vatican and institutions like that show up, all of a sudden the evidence magically disappears. Well, why? Because it goes against the scientism model of evolution. They've got no place to fit giants in there. The Bible tells you exactly what happened, where the giants come from in Genesis 6. And in Numbers 13, they're encountering the giants in the land of Canaan. And uh, Joshua and the Israelites came into the land, and there was a, basically a giant holocaust, a holocaust of giants, and a diaspora of giants. They didn't get all of them. Uh, the ones they didn't get took off. And there's evidence of giants all over the world where they dispersed to. So um, you know, giants is just one of those things that proves the biblical narrative that scientism doesn't want to have anything to do with. One of the things that um, has gotten me a lot of trouble are these weird skulls here from Peru. So I'm doing shows about them on my YouTube channel called Forbidden Paleontology because Christians don't want to work with it and the evolutionists don't. Except the alien guys, yes, they want to because they want to say these are alien skulls. Problem is, this little gal here turned out to be Scotch and she's in Peru 2,000 years ago. Go figure. <clears throat> so, but th these things are, um, uh, a lot of these skulls are complex. Now these, this one, this one, this one have only one parietal. You're supposed to have two, all right? But, now this guy here had two, but look how many extra bones he's got between his occipital and his parietals up here. He's got like 30 extra bones. So, are these primitive? Well, that's what they tell us, the poor old primitive Peruvians down there. Oh, really? So these little primitive guys down there that, uh, you know, lived in mud huts and all that. They made all those uh, stones over there at Sacsayhuaman, uh, Cusco, and Machu Picchu. Those little guys, they were primitive. Why, well, something's messed up here. As I continued to talk to Joe, I realized that the spiritual deception of scientism goes a lot further than I previously suspected. It was a deep, troubling thought I took away with me as I continued forward. So we can see in this clip yet more evidence that exists that shows that the Darwinism view that is being taught all over the world is not backed up by evidence. Okay, human footprints and dinosaur footprints in the same mud. The erosion rate alone should have wiped them out, but they're still there, which means that it's not millions of years old. It can't be millions of years old because it would be gone. In addition to the fact that it's dinosaurs and human footprints in the same mud, which goes against what science is teaching. Why? Because they are not teaching what the evidence 
points to. They're teaching their worldview because they are willfully forgetting creation and the flood. It all comes back to this. They do not want to teach the biblical narrative. Just like in Forbidden History, where it's saying they are purposefully doing whatever they can to construct theories that say the opposite of what the Bible says. They do not want to say what the Bible says. And so they will say anything else. And so even though we can see evidence right there, dinosaur footprints and human footprints in the same mud, meaning that dinosaurs and humans walked the earth at the same time, and it was not millions of years ago, even though we can see that evidence, they are not talking about it. They just brush it under the rug and they don't bring it to anybody's attention, which is why you have not heard these things in school. In addition to that, in this clip we just watched, he begins presenting some of the evidence for giants. And he connects the dots. He makes a very good point that if giants once existed, then Darwinism doesn't work. Because evolution is built on this principle of survival of the fittest. If giants once walked the earth, that contradicts the whole evolutionary picture. That whole lineup of monkey to man doesn't work if you've got a giant in the middle. It doesn't work. And they recognize this. And so they don't want you to know that there is an ample amount of evidence for giants because that contradicts the evolution story they've constructed. And they've constructed that story to contradict the Bible. They don't want the Bible to be true, and so they don't want you to know that giants are true, because the Bible also tells you that giants are true. And they don't want any evidence that makes people put more trust in the Bible. And now in this clip, they showed a very few brief pieces of evidence for giants, but there is actually a ton more evidence as well. So we're going to watch a clip here from another documentary which talks specifically about all of the evidence in North America, just North America, for giants. And this is, again, focusing in on just North America. This evidence is found all over the world. So let's watch this next clip. During the past few years, a huge controversy has emerged accusing the Smithsonian and a host of skeptics and archaeologists of covering up the discovery of hundreds of giant skeletons from Native American Indian mounds. Jim Firera is one of the key people who began uncovering hundreds of newspaper accounts of giant skeletons. Today, Fiera has pulled together about 1,500 accounts from newspapers and books published in the 1800s and early 1900s. One intriguing set of giant skeleton reports he found factual was the Arkansas Chickasaba Mound reports of many large skeletons found at the site. Many skeletons ranging from eight to nine feet in length had been found there. As late as 1976, a seven foot tall skeleton was found at the site. For the Smithsonian to have found skeletons that were seven feet tall by chance alone is improbable. The height of many of the individuals entombed in ancient American mounds was far taller than the general populace, far beyond what could be explained by simple chance. Why would the Smithsonian cover up such a find? You may be surprised at the number of giant skeletons that have been uncovered throughout modern history. There is a number of discoveries that didn't make it to mainstream historical knowledge. Large bones in stone graves in Williamson County and White County, Tennessee were discovered in the 1800s. The average stature of these giants was seven feet tall. Giant skeletons were found in the mid-1800s in New York State near Rutland and Rodman. In 1833, soldiers digging at Lompoc Ranchero, California, discovered a male skeleton 12 feet tall. The skeleton was surrounded by caved shells, stone axes, and other artifacts. The skeleton had double rows of upper and lower teeth. Unfortunately, this body was secretly buried because the local Indians became upset about the remains. A giant skull and vertebra were found in Wisconsin and Kansas City as well. A giant found off the California coast on Santa Rosa Island in the 1800s was distinguished by its double row of teeth, common among giant skeleton finds. A 9 foot 8 inch skeleton was excavated from a mound near Brewersville, Indiana in 1879. Skeletons said to be of enormous dimensions were found in mounds near Zanesville, Ohio and Warren, Minnesota in the 1800s. 
in Clearwater, Minnesota, the skeletons of seven giants were found in mounds. These had receding foreheads and complete double dentation, two rows of teeth. At La Crescent, Minnesota, mounds were found to contain giant bones five miles north in Dreschbach. The bones of people over eight feet tall were found. In 1888, seven skeletons ranging from seven to eight feet tall were discovered. Though they may seem like a lot, near Toledo, Ohio, 20 skeletons were discovered with jaws and teeth twice as large as those of present-day people. The account also noted that odd hieroglyphics were found with the bodies. The aforementioned miners in Lovelock Cave, California discovered a very tall red-haired mummy in 1911. In 1931, skeletons from eight and a half to 10 feet long were found in the Humboldt Lake Bed in California. And in 1932, Ellis Wright found human tracks in the gypsum rock at White Sands, New Mexico. His discovery was later backed up by Fred Arthur, supervisor of the Lincoln National Park, and others who reported that each footprint was 22 inches long and from eight to 10 inches wide. They were certain the prints were human in origin due to the outline of the perfect prints coupled with a readily apparent instep. During World War II, author Ivan T. Sanderson tells of how his crew was bulldozing through sedimentary rock when it stumbled across what appeared to be a graveyard. In it were crania that measured from 22 to 24 inches from base to crown, nearly three times as large as an adult human skull. Had the creatures to whom these skulls belonged been properly proportioned, they undoubtedly would have been at least 12 feet tall or taller. In 1947, a local newspaper reported the discovery of nine foot tall skeletons by amateur archeologists working in Death Valley. The archaeologists involved also claimed to have found what appeared to be the bones of tigers and dinosaurs with the human remains. And the Catalina Islands off California are the home of dwarf mammoth bones that were once roasted in ancient pit fires. These were roasted and eaten by human-like creatures who were giants with double rows of teeth. Along with the reports of double rows of teeth, extra digits in the hands and feet are sometimes reported. Along the Illinois River in a cave, a priest claimed he found prints in rock. The larger representation of the human foot was 14 inches and had six toes instead of five. Morris's Universal Geography, according to the priest, gives this account of a number of tracks or foot impressions found in rocks in the mountains of Tennessee. Along these were a number of tracks representing human feet, and they uniformly had six toes on each foot. The January 13, 1870 edition of the Wisconsin Decatur Republican reported that two giant well-preserved skeletons of an unknown race were discovered near Potsy, Wisconsin by workers digging the foundation of a sawmill near the bank of the Mississippi River. One skeleton measured seven and a half feet, the other eight feet. The skulls of each had prominent cheekbones and double rows of teeth. A large collection of arrowheads and strange toys were found buried near the remains. While a normal sized skeleton of a supposed mound builder is on display at the site of several large pyramidal monuments near Madison called Astalan State Park, the Goliath remains of Wisconsin's giants have vanished along with the hundreds of other discoveries throughout the Midwest. Why? Is there some conspiracy to hide these giant artifacts from the public? Giant skeleton finds have not made the local or national news much since the 1950s for the most part. It seems the opinion is that they fear that people would question evolution. During the time of these discoveries, 
the Smithsonian was taking possession of nearly every giant skeleton found throughout the entire country, including the largest discovery of skeletons found in the Great Mound in Ohio. What the intent of the institution was for the giant skeletons has never been discovered, but several investigators today believe the Smithsonian was founded, at least in part, to take the skeletons and hide or destroy them, dumping some by the barge full in the Atlantic Ocean. Why, one might ask. Some believe it was to hide the true history of the Earth, as giant skeletons were being discovered throughout the world in the late 1800s and some believe it was to back up Darwin's theory of evolution. If such entities lived on Earth thousands of years ago, then Darwin's theory would be automatically called into question. Never included in history books is the fact that every Native American tribe in America tells the same tale of having to fight and kill the giants because they were man-eaters and were decimating the native tribes. Perhaps because the giants were so large, the tribes mounded dirt to bury them instead of digging graves, which would explain the hundreds, if not thousands, of mound burial sites throughout America. Giant skeletal remains have been found from Brooklyn, New York, to the Channel Islands off the coast of California. Most of the remains are mass burials with signs of violent death, as if a huge battle had been fought then won and the massacred buried deep in mounds to contain them. So as you can see, there is actually a ton of evidence for giants, and this has barely scratched the surface. This is predominantly talking about North America. These giants are being found all over the world. And if you go online and you search for ancient giants book, okay, just search for that, you'll find a list of many, many different books that document these finds that are being found all over the world. Ancient giant skeletons are being found everywhere. And it's time that we begin to accept that there is a ton of archaeological evidence that backs up the story as told in the Bible and as told in the Book of Enoch. Giants lived on the earth. The evidence is all over the place. <laughs>